you're not recorded. All right, um, so we are joined by Mary Moriarty, who is the former um, Chief Public Defender of Hennepin County and who's been doing just amazing work, uh, helping us all understand what we're seeing with the, um, the Chauvin trial right now. Um, and Mary has helped, uh, or Mary has agreed <laughs> to answer these questions. Um, so the first one, Mary, is can you tell us like what exactly is the county attorney? Is that like a district attorney, which I think people are used to hearing like a DA or a district attorney? And like, what is this job exactly? So DA or district attorney is the same thing as county attorney. In Minnesota, we just have counties and the county attorney is elected in each county. Uh, whereas in other places, they're elected in a district. So same thing, but I think mostly on TV, you probably hear DA um, and nobody ever refers to the CA. So they're, they're exactly the same thing. Uh, the job is, is this, it, it actually, the county attorney has about 400 employees total and they have a civil division and they have a criminal division. The civil division, they actually defend the county, uh, Hennepin Healthcare. Uh, so if the county gets sued, they are the county's lawyers and all of the department's lawyers. They do uh, support and collections, child welfare cases, uh, mental health cases. So that's the civil division. And then they have a criminal division. They prosecute every felony in the county. So anything that's a felony in the county is their responsibility. If it's a misdemeanor, those are prosecuted by the city in which they happen. So you will see the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office prosecute Minneapolis misdemeanors and most gross misdemeanors. There are a couple of kinds of gross misdemeanors that the county does charge, but not very many. And the county attorney is also responsible for all juvenile cases in the county. Mm -hmm. So for most people, when they think of a county attorney, they're thinking of the criminal division. Um, and that's primarily what we are going to be talking about as we go through this. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we found um, on the recall is that people really understand that there's a connection between police and prisons but they don't have a good understanding of like the connection between prosecutors and incarceration. So can you talk about how the prosecutor's decisions drive mass incarceration? Mm -hmm. I think what most people don't understand is that the prosecutor is actually the most powerful entity in the system and that includes judges. And this is why uh, the police will arrest somebody uh, they may give them a citation, they may forward that case to the county attorney's office for potential charging, but the police cannot force the county attorney to charge anyone. And they, the police cannot charge anybody with a felony. The, a felony charge has to be done by what is called a complaint. Uh, and many of you have seen the complaint and complaints that were filed in the Chauvin case. And I should just take an aside here that the Hennepin County Attorney's Office originally prosecuted Chauvin, but the governor uh, ordered that the case be taken over by the Attorney General's Office. So that's not typical that I don't recall ever happening. So the lawyers that you see prosecuting the Chauvin case are not from the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. So anyway, um, let's say the police forward a case to the county attorney's office. What do they do? They can choose to decline it, which means not to prosecute it at all. Uh, they can choose to ask the police to do more investigation, to get more information. Uh, they can choose to do something called pre-charge diversion. That means they can contact the person and say, um, we think that you uh, <clears throat> did some kind of property crime, but uh, would you like to go to a diversion program? And if you complete that, you will never be charged. The advantage of that is, um, as you know, you know, if you Google somebody's name, if they're charged, that charge will always come up. And so the advantage of pre-charge diversion is that it would never come up because there won't be a charge if everything goes well. 
So let's say the county attorney decides to charge somebody. They get to decide uh, what the charge is. And this can be critical. And I'll give you an example here. We have uh, statutes on aggravated robbery and simple robbery. Uh, they can be very close. You know, simple robbery, you go and you, you take somebody's purse. Um, and if you pretend to have a gun, like you stick your hand in your pocket, give me your purse or else, that can be charged as an aggravated robbery, which usually involves a gun or a weapon. But there's a choice there. But here's the big difference. If the county attorney or the prosecutor, same thing, when I use the word county attorney, it's the same thing as saying prosecutor, decides to charge that as a simple robbery, if the person is convicted, they are presumed to get probation. If they choose to charge it as a, an aggravated robbery, the presumptive sentence is actually 48 months in prison. So that tells you the power of prosecutors even deciding what to charge. The other power that they have is, let's say they decide to charge someone, they have a couple of choices. They can send a summons out. A summons simply means you send uh, the complaint out in the mail and you summon the person to come to court on a particular date. You are not asking for bail at that point. The other decision the prosecutor can make is a complaint warrant. In other words, they have a complaint, but they're asking for bail and they have the sheriff serve that. And so the person is arrested by the sheriff or the police pick them up and they, they're held in jail on bail until they make a court appearance. So they are actually the entity that decides early on whether bail should be asked for in a certain case. Now you go before the judge at some point um, and the defense lawyer can argue uh, to reduce bail or release the person without bail, but there's already been a decision made by a county attorney that bail, that this person should get bail. So those are some of the decisions that people really don't think about. They have no reason to know about and they make a big deal before the case even gets into the system. Um, and then after that, the county attorney or prosecutor decides what to offer. Are they going to make an offer? Uh, they can, you know, if you're charged with a felony, they can decide after looking at it uh, to offer somebody a, a misdemeanor charge or what's called a continuance for dismissal. Uh, or they can ask for somebody to go to prison. Um, they uh, make the offer. Now, judges do have some control over sentencing. But by virtue of how they charge the case, a prosecutor may take some of that control away. For instance, we have mandatory minimums on some cases. That means that the legislature passed statutes that say, if you are convicted of a particular type of case, the mandatory minimum is X number of months. Now, judges can depart on some of those, but there are some they can't depart on. And so by virtue of the way the prosecutor charges it, that person, if convicted, has to go to prison and the judge can do nothing about it. Um, I'm going on and on here. Kathleen, do you think I missed anything early on in the process? No, I mean, it's just amazing to hear how much the discretion of the prosecutor really mm -hmm. drives incarceration rates, right? I mean, the yeah. prosecutor could choose diversion. They could choose, um, you know, less, they could choose charges that have lower um, sentencing guidelines, right? There's yeah. all these points across the whole process where the discretion of the prosecutor is really what's gonna drive the severity of the punishment. Yeah, and here's, here's another big thing. People are, so people have heard of the Fourth Amendment. So you can't be unreasonably seized. But what does that mean? Um, people are pulled over by police uh, for many reasons. And sometimes the police find drugs, uh, weapons, something like that on them. Usually uh, the issue in those cases are whether the stop and search was constitutional, meaning did the police violate the person's rights? The county attorney's office or the prosecutor will look at that case and they will determine whether they think the police have violated the person's rights or not. 
And if they think uh, the rights were violated, they can dismiss that case or actually never even charge it. If they think that uh, it is a legitimate um, stop or search, they can, we, we have what's called a suppression hearing. In Minnesota, it's just referred to as a Rasmussen hearing, but it's a suppression hearing. And the judge decides whether the cop followed the law or not. Uh, in, here's where I think the prosecutor can play a huge role with police accountability. So let's say a police officer, and well, I won't say let's say, there, there, there was a police officer from Corcoran who uh, had six different cases thrown out or suppressed by five different judges for violating clients' rights. In two of those cases, the judges found him not credible, which is judge language for lying. Judges never say lying in their orders. They'll say someone is not credible. And when that cop testified at the sixth hearing uh, where a case got thrown out, he was asked if he was aware of the other findings by the judges that he had violated people's rights. And he said, yes, I disagree with them. So I'm going to, <laughs> the judges, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. And at some point there, uh, supervisors from the public defender's office talked to supervisors from the county attorney's office and said, what are you going to do about this guy? And the answer was, we're not his employer. So here's where prosecutors can make a big difference in police accountability. When they see that people's rights are being violated, they can choose not to charge that case. They can try to educate the police officer about what he or she might have done wrong. A lot of times stuff that happens, it's just the cop not knowing any better, but sometimes it is the cop knowing better. And if the prosecutor were to call the police or chief of police and say, you know what, your officer continues to violate people's rights. We've told him or her um, that this isn't the way to go about it, but he keeps doing it. We're not gonna charge his or her cases. That would make a difference. So that's another way prosecutors play a big role. I should take a step back here. So as I, I mentioned, the DAs, district attorneys, county attorneys are elected. Um, that is the, the actual county attorney. Now I mentioned that the, they have about 400 employees and that includes legal office assistants, that sort of thing. But the elected county attorney is the person who sets the policy for the entire office. And individual prosecutors, assistant county attorneys is what they're called, have very little discretion. They have to follow the policies set forth by the elected county attorney. So I just wanted to remember to, to say that as well. So and, and, well, well, the way that that does, we, we, I have seen that you will interact with an individual prosecutor who will say, I would really like to offer your client whatever it is, but I can't, my hands are tied because of the policies of the elected county attorney. So that's why the elected county attorney in their policies are critically important because none of the assistant county attorneys can just go off and do what they think is right unless they get permission uh, from a supervisor or the county attorney. So ultimately then it's really Mike Freeman personally as Hennepin County attorney who is driving incarceration rates coming out of Hennepin County. I mean, it's his policies that are determining who's likely to get bail. It's his mm -hmm. policy about who will get a plea. It's his policy about how to charge things. Um, and he just gives marching orders that then other people follow. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and what's really interesting is that in Minnesota, when a, a county attorney sends somebody to prison, it's not the county that has to pay for it. It's actually, um, the Minnesota taxpayers. So there's no real accountability in terms of the county. And if you looked at it this way, if it was the individual county that had to pay, um, I imagine some county commissioners and people in Hennepin County would say, why is the county spending X amount of money to imprison people? What can you show us about why that makes us safer or why that's working? And that really never happens or doesn't happen as much because the county is not on the financial hook for that. The state is, and so it kind of gets lost. And the Department of Corrections, where people go to go to prison, 
has no choice in whether to accept someone. So they just create more space. You know, counties send them people to uh, that that they say have to go to prison. They can't say you're sending too many people to prison. They have to figure out how to accommodate them, um, and and obviously in in ways that don't always work terribly well for the person or the public. Thanks for that. That's really helpful to think about. I'd not thought about it like that before. The term, and, and people have written about it, is called correctional free lunch. Rachel Barco has actually written a book, um, and she talks a, a great deal about why that makes a difference. If individual county attorneys were held accountable um, for the people that they send to prison, uh, the cost of it, probably more people would be inquiring into, you know, show us the data about why this is working, either for or in terms of recidivism, meaning do people come back uh, on new crimes and public safety. Um, actually, Rachel Barca is very interesting. She, you could take a look at her book or um, she's, she's a prolific writer and she comments um, frequently on TV networks, that kind of thing. But she uh, has pointed out that if the criminal legal system was a corporation, it would have gone bankrupt a long time ago. But the interesting thing about it is that the public doesn't hold the legal system accountable. And the legal system just continues to do the things that it's always done and never has to prove to people that it works. In fact, we know it isn't working. We know that um, in general, when we send people to prison, we're sending way too many people to prison for way too long a time. They are not being rehabilitated. They're coming back and committing new crimes. It's not keeping the public safer, but I think because the, the system is so inside pool and kind of hard to understand, people don't always know the questions to ask. And so people don't say, uh, why are you continuing to get large amounts of money and you're using it in a way that's not making the public safer? And if we were a corporation, um, there would be people asking those questions, but, but we're not. So a lot of times you hear people call prosecutors like the top cop of the county. Um, and I mean, technically he's not a cop. <laughs> Correct. So, so why do people think about prosecutors or talk about them like the, as in that language as the top cop? Like what's the relationship between the prosecutor and the police like? You know, it, it really does depend. Uh, historically, of course, prosecutors have relied upon police officers to make their cases. Um, and so they've had a pretty cozy relationship. They've not wanted to do anything to harm that relationship. Freeman's office has had actually a strangely antagonistic relationship with the police and in ways that have been really damaging in, in some respect, and, and has also taken a hands-off approach uh, to the Minneapolis Police Department. And I mentioned earlier that one of the things, one of the areas I think we've really failed, um, I mean, after George Floyd died, I, you know, there was plenty of focus on the Minneapolis Police Department as there should have been, but I was also hopeful, and I was chief public defender at the time, I was hopeful that there would be a broad conversation about the role that other systems and other departments play in this because MPD just didn't get this way on its own. Um, county attorneys, probation, judges, everybody in the system bears responsibility for this. And so when I mentioned before that the county attorney's office has been, well, that cop were not his employer, it's a hands-off thing, that's extremely damaging um, because the county attorney is not um, holding the police accountable. The, the county attorney is also not being held accountable either um, for racial disparities. Uh, you know, I, the, the, you can look at the uh, county attorney dashboard. I don't know if any of you know that, but if you just uh, Google Hennepin County Attorney Dashboard, you can look at their data, including their racial data. I remember hearing Mike Freeman giving a presentation when that came out. And he said, well, you can see there that there are racial disparities, but that's not our fault. That's really because that's who we get from uh, schools and the, the police department. Um, so, so Freeman has had a very strange relationship in that 
He has not charged police officers except for uh, former officer Noor. Um, and, but he also has had this antagonistic relationship where he has not uh, tried to engage with the Minneapolis Police Department to talk about how they could do better. Uh, so I think both of those things are problematic. Um, when he char their office charged Noor, it was certainly problematic that that was the very first time that a police officer had been charged in the death of a civilian, but that the officer was black and that the person who was killed was white. Uh, and he, um, Noor was very aggressively prosecuted. Many people may forget this, but he was actually charged with intentional second degree murder and Chauvin is not. Chauvin is actually the top count is unintentional second degree murder. So for the very first time, when we had a cop who was being held accountable, he was overcharged in my opinion, and the jury did acquit him of intentional murder. And if you go back and you look at the facts of that case, Nor was frightened and you know shot out the window, which was manslaughter in my opinion, but certainly was not intentional second degree murder in any way, shape or form. Yet um, when, when Freeman's office was asked um, about whether they were gonna charge Chauvin, um, they did come up with a third degree uh, murder charge and we can certainly talk about the problems with that, but they didn't charge him with intentional second degree murder. Yeah, can we spend some time talking about how um, Mike Freeman handled the Chauvin um, case because a lot of us, and if you go on the Recall Freeman website, we actually have an annotated version of the ch uh, charging document showing all of the ways that really it seemed like Mike Freeman was acting as his defense attorney rather than a prosecutor. Um, yeah. Throughout the document, there are all sorts of references to things that are irrelevant to what was happening or characterizations of George Floyd. Um, can you talk about how in that particular case, Freeman, was really kind of refusing to hold Chauvin accountable and um, really acting as a defense attorney <laughs> rather than a prosecutor? Yeah, um, every defense lawyer, public defender I know was sort of semi-joking about how they'd never seen a complaint like that and how they wished all of the complaints charging their clients listed all of the defenses as well. I mean, nobody had ever seen a complaint like that before. If you take a step back, um, Freeman took many, many months to charge Noor. He was very intentional and deliberate and, and took a very long time. <clears throat> and that in and of itself is certainly not something I would ever object to. I think prosecutors need to make charging decisions very carefully. But people who work as public defenders know that our clients get held in custody and charged right away. And then the investigation happens after that. Um, and so it wasn't so much that uh, he took forever uh, to decide whether to charge. It was that everybody can see that there are really two systems, um, one for cops, one for public defender clients. Um, and, and the harm in that too is that a public defender client will be arrested and held um, sometimes for months um, and sometimes their case gets dismissed after they actually do their investigation and figure out that the person should not have been charged. In any event, uh, after George Floyd died, uh, there was a lot of pressure. If you think back as to what was happening at the time, um, people were demonstrating, but it was also getting much more intense. Um, and uh, there was starting to be property damage and, and, and violence. And people were trying to encourage Freeman behind the scenes to charge him Chauvin, <clears throat> hoping that that would um, kind of preempt what people were afraid was going to happen. And he was refusing. Um, and finally, he came out with the third degree murder, which uh, was very controversial because that was the same charge that he had originally charged uh, former officer Noor with. And many of us in the legal community didn't think it actually applied to Noor. Uh, we didn't think it applied to Chauvin either because of a, and I won't go into the weeds on this, but, but this is being addressed by the Supreme Court or will be this summer. And so most people didn't think third degree murder fit what Chauvin had done. 
Uh, and at some point there, um, and I think it happened on the same day. Uh, the, so the governor had decided to take the case out of Freeman's hands, take it away from the office. Um, and Freeman tried to preempt that or make it look like, um, he, he sent out a press release um, asking um, the AG's office to assist uh, in the prosecution when in fact the governor was taking it away from the county attorney's office and giving it to the attorney general, um, which is what happened. And that is why you're not see one of the reasons why you're not seeing any people, except for there's one employee from the county attorney's office who's occasionally been in the courtroom but hasn't participated. Um, that is why you're seeing the attorney general prosecute this case. Uh, it was because the governor took it away from the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. So we're used to seeing Mike Freeman not hold police accountable for violence and up into including murder. Um, but that's not the entire the entirety of the violence that really is done to BIPOC communities by his office. So could you talk a little bit about how the decision that Mike Freeman had the decisions that Mike Freeman makes um, like every day <laughs> are, you know, really sure. doing violence to, you know, black folks, indigenous people of color, um, you know, just in the everyday operations of his office. So one of the things I already mentioned is that they will charge people without a thorough investigation. Um, there were often times when lawyers in the public defender's office would say to prosecutors on the day of the second appearance, which was often about a month later, hey, have you looked at the body cam? Because it doesn't match what this police report said. And the, the assistant county attorney would say, no, I haven't looked at it. And so they're charging cases without having looked at the body cam. And then some of the prosecutors will dismiss at that time, some of them won't. Um, there is a culture in that office uh, of not making really legitimate offers like plea negotiations until the often until the day of trial. What that means is that if somebody is held on bail, they sit until the day of trial until an offer is made. And the problem is sometimes that offer is credit for time served. So, okay, you've been sitting long enough, you can plead guilty now and get out. And the, the problem with that is, first of all, the person didn't need to sit that long and, and it's, you know, they've been sitting there for months and they may have lost their job, um, their housing, all kinds of things. And um, the other thing is that it, if we're, and we see this, uh, there are many people who want to trial, but when the offer is, is something like credit time served or, plead to a misdemeanor or plead to the simple robbery. But if you go to trial, you're going to go to trial on the original offense and you're gonna stay in until the trial, or even if it's on the trial date, um, you're gonna go through several days of trial. And if you're convicted, you're looking at the original sentence, it's very hard for a client to turn down the, you get out of jail today or plead to a misdemeanor and get out of jail today. But if you go to trial on the felony, you could go to prison or have a felony on your record. And so there's a whole culture there that needs to be changed. And that is um, if, you know, fully investigate cases, um, if they're charged um, and you think they should settle, make an offer at the pretrial, what we call the pretrial. Um, don't just wait um, and not really prepare or make a legitimate offer until the date of trial, because we that means we have many people who are just languishing in jail, waiting for their trial date, because everybody knows that's when they'll make a legitimate offer. Um, so that's one of the ways uh, that they harm people, because the people who are in jail are often going to be the BIPOC people, the people who can't afford bail. Um, the other thing that they can they do is they have very strict policies about certain kinds of cases. I'm just going to give you an example here. Uh, there's an offense called being a prohibited person in possession of a gun. If you if you get caught with a gun and you don't have any prior convictions, generally it's a gross misdemeanor. And the city attorney in Minneapolis actually under Susan Siegel developed this wonderful program based on trauma principles, 
because she was noticing that many of the people charged with that were like in the 18 to 25 area, often young black men. And what they were originally doing was offering them 30 days in jail and then stayed in probation. And she noticed that almost all of them were coming back on a more serious offense. And so she paid for out of her budget, uh, a very good program that involved um, addressing trauma and why the person actually had a gun in the first place. And it's been remarkably successful. But if you have certain prior convictions and they don't have to be violent, by the way, they, you know, if, if you said felon in, which is what people refer to it, felon in possession. And I say to you, well, what do you think the felon um, part of it is? Most people say, murder, rape, something like that. And that's usually not the underlying offense. In fact, several years ago, we did a study on it and I think more than half were prior drug offenses. So, um, so you, we will have clients also in that 18 to 25 year um, age group, often young black men who come in, they've got one prior conviction and that means they're charged with felon in possession instead of the gross misdemeanor the mandatory minimum for that is five years. And the Hennepin County Attorney's Office has a very strict policy not to negotiate those cases. And that is one of the areas where you will hear assistant county attorneys in chambers talking to the defense lawyer in the court saying, yeah, you know, I'd like to give your client probation. He should get probation, but I can't. Now, who are these people who come in on the felon in possession? Um, they're often people who are scared um, of the violence in Minneapolis and who have a gun in their car um, or you know, somewhere to protect themselves. Um, they are uh, young people who have suffered from a lot of trauma, um, but most importantly, they're, they're young people who are not helped by going to prison for five years. Um, and so the public defenders often make really good arguments. We, we have um, dispositional advisors or social workers who do social histories of clients and present that to the court. The court can depart um, and give the person probation. Uh, and that's always over the objection of the county attorney um, because of their strict policies. So there are many cases where people recognize that this person should not be going to prison because it's not, I mean, they, to be actually um, prohibited person just means you've got the gun in your possession and it doesn't even have to be on you. It can be constructive possession. It would be charged a different crime if you were actually using the gun, threatening somebody, shooting, that kind of thing. So it's not that, um, it's possession, whether actual possession or constructive possession. And so there are plenty of people who are going to prison on those types of cases uh, who shouldn't. I wanna give you one. So I said that there are some cases where the judge can't depart. And I know this is gonna sound odd, but we always refer to those as mandatory, mandatory minimums. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, a case where uh, public defender's office had a client on a, a drug case and the client had a prior drug case, which made the current drug case a mandatory, mandatory minimum. In other words, the judge could not depart. Well, the current drug case happened because an undercover police officer approached the client as he was leaving the Hennepin County Medical Center pharmacy and asked him if he could buy some of the pills he had just received with his prescription. And the client said yes, and he got charged with third degree sale. And because of his prior record, it was a mandatory, mandatory meaning he had to go to prison. So the interesting thing that happened was that um, the client had really, really, the client had gone to treatment. Um, the judge was very, very unhappy with the county attorney that they would not offer a departure. And so she, over their objection, sent um, that client to treatment. And uh, they appealed, the county attorney's office appealed, which they did not have to do, but they did appeal saying that she did not have the discretion to do that and they were right. But the, the judge um, now retired, not a liberal judge by any stretch of the imagination. Um, <laughs> she was so upset with them. She said, 
this guy has gone to treatment. He's a star in treatment. The treatment people came forward to say how wonderfully he was doing. There is absolutely no point to send this man to prison. And so she made this entire record. Um, and then as time went on, it took a little while for the appeal to happen. Um, he was doing great, fabulous. And I think he was in drug court actually. And I think the day he actually graduated from the treatment program, the court of appeals reversed the judge saying that she had to send him to prison. And so she did. And I was not there, but I was told that most of the people in the courtroom were crying um, because they liked this guy. He had done everything that was asked of him. The case, like I said, was an undercover cop who approached him to ask to buy his prescription. And this was all the choice of the county attorney to charge him with a mandatory, man mandatory, mandatory, to appeal it I mean, they didn't have to appeal it. They could have just said, you know, judge, we don't think you have the authority, but oh well. Um, but they did. And that man went to prison. So uh, that is a story that will always stick with me about the power and the discretion of the prosecutor. And we're talking about, in that case, uh, some pills, right? Um, a prescription, some pills. Uh, and so, so that's just one way a county attorney's office can can really, really harm um, people in the community. So I think one last question and then we'll just open it up to folks. We had talked about maybe doing small groups, but I think we are a kind of small enough group that we can probably just start with questions if, if folks would prefer that. Um, do people have a preference or would you like some time in groups to be able to meet other people and talk with them or you wanna get straight to questions? What do you think? You can use the chat, you can unmute yourself and say what you'd like to do. Well, while you're deciding and putting your decision in the chat, I'm gonna ask Mary the last question that we have prepared uh, before we open it up to y'all. So um, one of the things that I struggle with um, a lot is, um, you know, Mike Freeman's office and Mike Freeman himself They've been under a ton of community pressure to change their practices, right? Um, especially, you know, at least since 2015 with the murder of Jamar Clark, um, there has been an enormous amount of attention on Mike Freeman and his office and their charging decisions um, and their role in protecting police who use violence against the community. And why is it that with so much pressure coming from the public, so much public support for non-punitive practices that are gonna be restorative and um, lead to less racially discriminatory outcomes. How is it that he's been able to avoid to be so unresponsive to public pressure? Why is that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's exactly the same thing. He, he is only accountable to the voters and he just got reelected two years ago. So, you know, what's his motivation? Um, I, I will tell you, I, I've known him, I've had to work with him for a while, and it took me a long time to figure out what motivated him. And, and to me, it's mostly uh, news. And it's like, like many politicians. I mean, he's, he's one of the old school type of prosecutors, the law and order, tough on crime, but he does talk about things that he does and frame them in a way that are progressive when they're not. And, and so many of the decisions he makes or the policies he has are about not wanting to see his office in the newspaper if something bad happens. And I can give you an example of that. A couple of years ago, there was a lot of really bad publicity about child protection cases in Hennepin County. Um, there were some really bad outcomes there. And Mike Freeman was very public about saying, well, our office didn't even really touch those cases. And, and he, he was very public about saying, we are going to petition every case that comes through here. And so we, everybody saw a huge change. And, and when I say petition, it's um, child protection workers in the county attorney's office have a choice whether to, um, when, when there's a neglect or abuse or something like that, to petition for, to terminate the parents' rights. Uh, and they were petitioning on every case, like 
even when caseworkers didn't think it was appropriate. And they were doing that because he, and judges were dismissing some of them, by the way. Um, but the reason he was doing that, I surmise, was that if something was going to happen to one of those children, he was going to be able to say, not my office's fault. It was some judge that dismissed it. And he can say that about pretty much everything, you know, having um, conservative policies about, or, you know, strict policies about guns. If, or anything else. If somebody goes out and does something bad, which will inevitably happen because it just does, he will always point the finger at somebody else. It's not my fault, I asked for bail. It's not my fault, we wanted that person to go to prison. So to me, that's been the driving force behind many of his policies. Um, and he gets away with that because when something bad has happened, and then, you know, you all know what's on the news then. It's like something bad happened. He has a press conference. It's the judge's fault. And then the judge's picture is in the news. And then a lot of the public says, we need to get rid of that judge. That's just horrible. So I don't think we found a really effective way to talk to the public through the media about um, why progressive or reform policies are good and about and to be able to talk about what happens if something goes wrong. And I, I will give you an example. And I think it's in um, lacrosse, maybe. Um, no, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I have a friend there who's a private defense lawyer. And he said they have a critical incident group that includes the chief judge, public defenders, defense lawyers, and prosecutors. And if something terrible happens to somebody, they get together and they figure out how to message it. In other words, they don't throw each other under the bus. If some judge lets somebody out, which they should be doing when they're following the law and something bad happens, they're not gonna point the finger at the judge. Um, but that's not the culture we have here. If something bad happens, I guarantee you, uh, Freeman will have a press conference and he will point the finger at somebody else. So that's why he's been successful at it. I don't think the public really um, understands what a difference policies can make. And it's such an easy soundbite for him to talk about, I'm tough on guns. I mean, we have a lot of gun violence right now. So why wouldn't that resonate with people in the community? Um, rather than, you know, what, what's something that's really happening is we shouldn't be sending um, some people to prison on these gun cases, especially these possession cases, because the people are coming back and committing more serious offenses. And we do have other effective ways of rehabilitating them, which is better for public safety. But you see how long that took me to say that. It's much easier to say I'm tough on guns. And so we have a long way to go, I think, to educate the public about other policies uh, and about why they work and about why um, just these slogans, which sound nice and the media can tend to go for, um, does not make us safer as a community. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the consensus is we'd like to go straight into Q&A, which is totally great. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Mary, please feel free to either um, unmute yourself and ask your question using your voice. Um, the only thing I'd like to uh, caution you though is that we are recording. So if you would prefer not to appear on the screen um, and therefore not in the video, um, you can also feel free to put your question in the chat or anyone can just use the chat too if you prefer that. But uh, with that said, uh, who has a question for Mary? There's a question in the chat that says, if we get a progressive prosecutor into office in 2022 or before, what is the first action they should take in order to build a more just county? What a great question. Yeah, that is a good question. And there's plenty that can happen. Um, one of the things off the top of my head is Minnesota is an outlier in juvenile justice. Um, years ago, actually, the US Supreme Court said that juveniles should not go to life or serve life without parole. And Minnesota is still an outlier um, <clears throat> in that um, they certify as adults a lot of youth who shouldn't be. Um, and so I, I think there are a lot of policy decisions that a new prosecutor can implement right away. 
Um, one of it, which is, do we want to certify youth as adults? Um, do we need to, and I know there's actually a bill in the legislature this year to limit um, or to give, I think, I think the, the juvenile, the max sentence on um, the, the murder would be 15 or 20 years um, instead of life. Um, and so, but that's something, if it doesn't go through, that is a policy that the county attorney can make. I am not going to be asking for life sentences or anything near that for youth under 18 who commit murder. Um, there are a lot of other policy decisions like um, on marijuana. I just, I, I, I did talk to you about a little bit about pre-charge diversion. Um, even though that office talks about pre-charge diversion, I can tell you it's just a handful of clients they actually offer it to. So they could be offering it to many more clients than that. They do talk about not prosecuting people on marijuana charges, but they do. Um, they will charge them uh, and sometimes offer diversion, but if they have prior drug charges, including marijuana charges, they will prosecute, <laughs> which makes no sense. Um, I think that there's a lot to be done in terms of changing their policies on what's called Brady, meaning, um, what kind of material should they be disclosing to the defense that they don't? Um, the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office, when I was there, had a lot of problems getting um, disclosures from them um, that were required under the um, United States case law or the Supreme Court case law and mandating that prosecutors look at video before they charge cases. And I think there needs to be some retraining of prosecutors in that office. Actually, I think there needs to be, it, may, it needs to be made clear that the culture in that office has to be about doing the right thing, doing justice. And it's not. I mean, we hear that over and over and over, but it really is about winning. And prosecutors aren't supposed to be about winning. They are supposed to be about doing justice. And so there needs to be uh, new values um, articulated for people in that office. There needs to be training, you know, for instance, about what is constitutional and what isn't. It needs to be made clear to people in that office that they shouldn't be prosecuting cases where people's rights have been violated. It should be made clear that um, we have working partnerships with the police departments where we are talking to police chiefs and whoever it is that's responsible for training and that kind of thing. Um, I, I could go on and on and on actually about a ton of policy issues. Also, um, in terms of disparities, I know they are doing very little on disparities. So um, whenever Freeman talks about disparities, he talks about the ratio of people of color who work in his office. And that's a good thing. You want people of color to work in your office, but there's never been a look at the county attorney's role in uh, either creating or maintaining the racial disparities in their charging. If you look at their data, they have terrible racial disparities, but I've never heard any discussion of what can we do about that. Other prosecutors' offices throughout the country are trying things like, let's remove names, addresses from complaints um, to see if, if maybe that can eliminate some of the bias um, you can certainly talk to police departments about who they're targeting for drug um, cases. You can stop sending so many people to prison on drug cases um, because that's their choice. And they do send a lot of people to prison on drug cases. You can, you can really pitch um, treatment. Um, you can, I think, I think there has to be a real building of partnerships within the community um, to create programs that people can go to that would be effective, like trauma-informed programs. So that's not like one of the first things you could do, but you can start building those kinds of relationships. Um, I actually had a conversation with Freeman a couple of years ago where I said, would you work with me on trying to figure out some different things we can do with youth um, ages 18 to 25? Um, and I, and I, was, I said, because of adolescent brain development. And he actually said to me, I believe in adolescent brain development until you're 18 and then not so much. And I remember thinking, is this like climate denial? I mean, I like <laughs> the research is the research. 
adolescent brain development continues on to 25 and beyond. And that is such a large part of the people who were prosecuted. Um, and so I, I think that there are a lot of reforms to be made there. Um, so that's, I know that was kind of a long answer to that. So there's a question from um, another, uh, from Peter, mm -hmm. says, Mary, thank yeah. you so much for being here. Can you speak to the progressive prosecutor movement more generally? Is it yeah. possible for any prosecutor to be progressive? Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Progressive think, prosecutors beat a soft on crime messaging. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's a question my public defender friends and I have. Um, I've got one friend who's very adamant about progressive prosecutors just being less mean prosecutors. <laughs> that's just his opinion. Um, and I do understand that. And, and from one respect, I do not like the term progressive prosecutor. I tend to think of it as you need somebody who's never been a prosecutor, um, like Larry Krasner, because when you've been a prosecutor, you tend to think in this box in which you've been raised, and you tend to think of the kinds of changes you can create within that box. And that tends to be expungement, um, which is a big deal for a lot of people, but it's not a big reform. Although I'll tell you, Freeman has refused to participate in the expungement stuff that John Choi has been working on. So I, there are people who have called themselves progressive prosecutors throughout the country. I followed all of them pretty much. Um, some of them um, have done some good things. Some of them have just called themselves progressive prosecutors and have done the same things that their predecessors did. Um, some of them have, and, and, and this, this tells you something, there are a number who are Black women um, who are being mercilessly attacked um, for trying to be more progressive, and that's been a huge problem. Um, Krasner, Larry Krasner, I've talked to, and I've looked at some of the data out there. He, of course, um, you know, the, the police union was totally against him. This whole soft on crime, um, that is certainly the messaging uh, that has been used typically on prosecutors or anybody who tried to uh, reform. Um, but I think his data supports the fact that that's not true. He actually has the numbers on how many years his offices um, kept people out of prison and recidivism. And, and I think data is really important so that you can say, really, okay, well, here's the number of years that um, people have not gone to prison and yet crime has, you know, fill in the blank, gone down. Or, and it's, it's tough right now because I think crime has gone up all over the country. Um, and that certain, I should say, certain types of crime, not all crime. Um, but for instance, carjackings, um, it might surprise people to know that those are up all over the country, not just here. And part of that is COVID. Um, part of that is economics. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. It's hard to parse it apart. And you can't say it's somebody's progressive policies that have led to that. Um, so when I think about progressive prosecutors, I, I wish there was another, another title, um, because in my mind, you need somebody to come in who um, it just has a different framework. Um, you know, even, uh, so I've heard the county attorney's office here talk about um, victims. And, and I, if you haven't read Danielle Sered's work about restorative practices, you should for violent offenses. It's, it's brilliant work. And she works with people she calls um, harmed parties and uh, responsible parties. And she talks about how, and I think this is very true if you ask many people who have been harmed, that the criminal legal system really gives no closure to anybody who's been harmed, mostly. Um, and that if you asked harmed people what they want, she says like 99% of them will say, I wanna make sure this never happens to anyone again. Yet the legal system continues to do things that will all but ensure that that does happen. And I, as a public defender, have seen prosecutors treat victims like crap for years, um, especially victims of color. Um, and, and so, you know, when you're in the system and you see what they actually do, um, it, it's much different um, than what they say. So, like I said, I, I, 
many different people who market themselves as progressive prosecutors and their policies are all over the place. I think um, one that I'm watching right now is Chesa Boudin out in San Francisco, see how he's doing. Um, he has some interesting policies, but I think it has to continue to evolve. It can't just be, if you're gonna, I mean, the system is so full of structural racism um, and other issues. You can't just pick off the things like expungement, diversion, that kind of thing. You really have to try to make some systemic changes, which does require working with other people, um, it, not only in the criminal system, but other people in, in the city, city council, mayors, that kind of thing, because you have to set up, um, you have to get cities to set up the infrastructure uh, to help people um, so that they can get jobs, so that they can um, deal with their trauma. And that's the way of actually keeping people from coming in the system. That is such a helpful answer. And it goes right into the next question, which is from Callie, mm -hmm. who says, what other plays in the judicial system and other arms of government could or should the county be attorney be working with to support yeah. restorative justice practices and policies? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, first of all, well, not first of all, but judges and probation officers. Um, Probation, interestingly, I, I told you about Susan Siegel when she was the Minneapolis city attorney coming up with that trauma-based program for gross misdemeanor gun charges. I think she actually approached probation in Hennepin County and they wouldn't fund it. That's why it actually came out of her own budget. And so what exactly are we doing with all of the money that we put into community corrections in Hennepin County? Um, we and I, I know a lot of probation officers, and I know some of them to be outstanding. Who, like all of us, would be like, Hey, you know, can you take this case? Because we wanted that probation officer to mentor our client. And then they got a bunch that seemed to be there simply to try to figure out how to send clients to prison. Um, so I think there needs to be a big change in probation. There needs to be a big change in the kind of programming they offer. I think there needs to be a big change in, in whether or not people are actually working with probation. Um, one of the programs that the city, Minneapolis City Attorney and Hennepin County Public Defender's Office came up with, as well as Health and Human Services, was restorative court. And the idea there was on misdemeanor cases, people would come in on, it wasn't on domestics or on uh, DWIs, it was all other kinds of stuff, usually called livability crimes. And those clients would work directly with a social worker. Um, nobody wanted probation involved and nobody actually wanted lawyers and the judge involved either. And as it turns out, recidivism has gone way down, clients show up, um, they love working with a probation or excuse me, a social worker, understandably. And so, you know, why do we have so many people on probation? We don't need this many people on probation. Probation is not terribly helpful. Probation is very intrusive. Uh, imagine this, you're on probation and you have, you were monitored for drug use. You have to call in every morning. And if you're they have a color wheel. If your color comes up, you've got to get yourself down to do a UA. Um, so there are lots of things about probation that don't work that we could do better. Um, judges, you know, judges are trained to um, kind of be in the middle because if they're too quote unquote liberal, they'll get filed on, removed by the county attorney's office, and then they can't be in criminal anymore. Um, and the same is true as if they're too conservative, although we don't have, <laughs> I mean, if they're too, the, so it, it doesn't work the other way. What I'm trying to say is if you had a prosecutor's office who worked with the judges and who said, you know what, I, I'm fine with this departure and I am not going to call a press conference and put you on the news. Come on, let's do better on this stuff. Let's, um, I think prosecutors of the county attorney's office can give permission to the judges to do things that they're afraid to do right now. Because I'll tell you, I've had a number of judges who will actually admit to me they are afraid of doing certain things, like letting some people out on bail because they're afraid something bad will happen and then something, somebody will run against them in re-election when they are up for election. Now, rarely does anybody run against a judge. Um, it just doesn't happen, but it's a real fear that they have. And so by working with the judges and saying, hey, 
I'm not going to set you up um, for, you know, it should be in the paper so people run against you if you are dismissing too many cases because of violation of people's rights. Um, and that's sometimes what happens. Judges feel like, you know, somebody from the county attorney's office is going to have a conversation with them about why are you dismissing so many cases? Why are you letting so many people out on bail? And so that's something that that can happen. Oh, there's also a way to work with the county in general. Um, one thing that was interesting to me is that when COVID came about, the overall jail population was at the time, I think it was, oh, so the functional population of the jail downtown is 755. And there were actually more people in custody at the time. So COVID rolls around, they make a concerted effort to reduce the jail population. And it does go way down to between four and 500. Um, and interestingly, the data did show that those people that were let out, who never would have been let out otherwise, have not committed new crimes. Um, so what should be happening now is an analysis of, um, okay, we have been assuming that those people, uh, we needed to keep those people in, and we certainly didn't. What do we do to keep them, or let's keep them out? But one interesting thing to me was that I asked for the data, the racial data, and we know that there are huge racial disparities of the population at the jail. And when I got the racial data kind of, it was in the middle of COVID after a couple of months, the population had gone way down, but the racial disparities had gone about one or 2% up. And I said to somebody from the county, you know, we're not addressing racial disparities. What are we doing about that? And this person who's at a high level in the county said, well, but when we, when the whole prison or jail population goes down, that means that there are less black people in jail. And I said, that's not addressing disparities. And he kind of shrugged his shoulders. And so, you know, because the county attorney is elected, they, they have a platform to push people on stuff like that, push the county on that. Like, what are we doing about racial disparities in the system? We really need to do something about that. Right now, what we've had is people in the county um, throwing up their hands and waiting for Mike Freeman to retire because they don't feel like they can get him to do anything because he is only accountable to the voters. And so if you have a county attorney um, who's pushing those kinds of things, I think that will go a long way to get everybody else in the county and the judges. Um, and as I said, talking to city council members, legislators about what's actually needed to keep people out of the system. There are a whole bunch of people involved here that can play a role. Um, so we have a, another question in the chat. And just a reminder, y'all are welcome to unmute and ask your questions. <laughs> I don't have to read all of them. <laughs> um, so here's another question. This one comes from Becky. What are ways a different approach to prosecution could improve public health or in what ways do current prosecution approaches impact public health in undesirable ways? Yeah, I think a lot of it impacts public health in undesirable ways by yanking people off the street, keeping them in on bail, um, sending them to prison, um, breaking up families. Um, we, we know, and we shouldn't need data to tell us this, but when somebody goes to prison, their whole family struggles. Children of incarcerated folks do much worse, um, understandably. Um, that doesn't help from a public health perspective. But, but also, you know, because of budget cuts too. I mean, I, I can think of very few people um, that prison's been helpful to. It's not as though there's a whole bunch of programming there that's helpful. I have I've talked to a few people who've said, I needed to settle down um, and prison was okay, but I didn't need to be there for that long. And we know that people grow out of um, committing crimes, people age out of it. Um, and so I, I don't think, I don't see the county attorney's office approaching anything from a public health perspective. Like um, they, they could be, so we have a drug court uh, in Hennepin County and it used to be that the prosecution had to agree to let somebody go there. And they would challenge practically, there's so many people 
And drug court was actually designed for people who were high risk and high need, yet they would challenge uh, people getting in there. Um, so, and I remember having a conversation, I just thought of that now, I was on the steering committee for drug court and we actually had a conversation uh, as, and this is a bunch of lawyers as to whether we uh, should allow uh, drug assisted treatment, uh, medication assisted treatment in drug court. Um, and I remember saying at the time, I am not a doctor. If some doctor is, and this was, this was like, maybe six years ago, if a doctor prescribes medication assisted treatment, I don't know why we as lawyers would say a person can't um, uh, come to drug court, but it was a huge battle. And only when Hennepin Health uh, or Hennepin County Health and Human Services stepped in and said, you're violating some rules here, you have to let people in. But, but it was from the county attorney's office that was saying, no, 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 we can't let people in drug court if they're on medication-assisted treatment. Now, you know, medication-assisted treatment is the gold standard. Um, and so I, I don't see the county attorney's office approaching much of anything from a public health perspective in the way they prosecute, in the, the, the bail that they ask for, the sentences, like what they do with marijuana cases. I mean, it, when I um, when I heard Mike Freeman say they were no longer prosecuting um, uh, marijuana cases, I sent out an email to our office. Hey, I just heard at a meeting that they're no longer prosecuting marijuana cases. And then I started getting these emails. Well, they're prosecuting my case. Look at this. You know, so I would look at these cases. And one of them, I remember they were off, they charged a guy on a marijuana case. They were offering, they wanted him to plead guilty to it. They were offering him a gross misdemeanor. And I called Mike Freeman, or I emailed him and I said, did I misunderstand you? I thought you weren't uh, charging these. And he said, well, there are some exceptions. <laughs> and the exceptions are quite long. But the problem with that particular case was that this client had prior drug cases. How can that possibly be a public health approach? Um, we have a crisis uh, in opioid addiction in this country. Um, and what are we, we're not really approaching that from a public health perspective, either from the prosecutor's office. So there are plenty of things that I think the prosecutor could do, um, but that requires actually being familiar with the latest research um, and data uh, and being willing to support uh, things that haven't been supported in the past. Um, that, that might put you out there um, and run the risk of criticism, but that's really what needs to happen. Well, thanks. Um, so far, we just have one last question in the chat and it seemed like a good question to go out on. So I uh, saved it <laughs> for oh. a little bit here. Um, and that's a question about the recall. Oh, yep. Um, so the question comes where is it from Gail? And it says, I think this group is called Recall Mike Freeman. Do you want him recalled before 2022? And are there action steps to be followed? So yes, <laughs> we absolutely want Mike Freeman to be recalled before 2022. Um, and we are taking action to collect those signatures this summer. Um, we know that the Minneapolis Police Department um, on average uh, tends to shoot and kill someone every eight months. Um, and so it is likely, it is very likely that there will be another uh, police violence case between now and when Mike Freeman, his term is up. And we believe that we can't trust him to hold police accountable. And so the sooner we can get Mike Freeman out, the sooner we can start holding police accountable for using violence against our neighbors. So we're absolutely moving forward on um, the recall and this summer we're going to be collecting uh, signatures throughout Minneapolis um, and in the suburbs and anyone who wants to be involved in that um, we want you to help we need your help uh, we can only do this together one thing that Mary said that I want to um, lift up as really important is that we need people who are educating the public who don't understand what prosecutors do, who don't understand how harmful prosecutorial practices currently are and how they could be different 
And our work is really twofold right now. So one, we're collecting all those signatures to get Mike Freeman out of office. And two, we're gonna be deep canvassing in the suburbs and talking with people um, in the suburbs where Mike Freeman's support is the strongest about what's possible, how we could have a different culture um, in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office and how that would both make us safer um, and also um, be more just. And so uh, we're gonna be doing that this summer, deep canvassing throughout the suburbs and we'd love for y'all to join us and uh, talk with folks. And absolutely, there's a phone banking component and text banking. So if you are someone who um, is not comfortable on the doors or needs to stay home for health reasons or other reasons, um, absolutely, you can do phone banking and text banking as part of our program um, and we will follow up with you. So. Um, yeah, if you're interested, I will send out an email to folks um, after this, just with some follow-up steps that people can take to be a part of what we're doing this summer. Um, and I think uh, if there are no other questions, uh, perhaps that is, I think I see Peter typing, so maybe there's something coming. <laughs> um, but if there are no other questions, we can um, just say thank you so much, Mary. Is there anything you'd like to say to end that you didn't get to share with us? Yeah, I think we went through a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what I think is the one of the toughest things is that it's very hard to figure out exactly what prosecutors do on a day-to-day -day basis and to figure out what's what's actually happening. And, and that's one of the reasons why I enjoy doing things like this, because as a public defender, I see what they do and I know that what they talk about is very different. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to continue having conversations and be reading, you know, there are, so there's something called the Marshall Project, which collects media from all over the country. They do talk a lot about progressive prosecutors. They have many, many articles there. Uh, and if you're trying to get a sense of what people are doing in other cities, that's a good um, thing to follow. You can, you can sign up for a, a daily notice of, of what they send out. But I think really trying to educate ourselves about what prosecutors do and be thinking about uh, what we want. And, and you know, here, I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. One thing that I think a lot about are traffic stops, um, particularly involving the Minneapolis Police Department because we have the data from them. Uh, that there are very large racial disparities and that they don't find um, that the hit rates, um, which is you know how often do they actually find contraband, drug or guns, um, is very low, like less than half of 1% uh, with black drivers. It's actually slightly higher with white drivers. And so I think a lot about, you know, what, what roles have we tasked police to do? Um, we have really lost much of our social safety net. Um, and we do ask police to do a lot of things that they should not do and they're not good at doing. And actually, if you ask them, they'll tell you that. Um, and so I think uh, we, we can all benefit by thinking, what is it that you know, what are each of these things we've tasked police to do? And do we want an armed response? Um, and if not, what do we want? And, and as I said, I think about traffic stops a lot. And I know that other cities are starting to look at that. In fact, Berkeley has transferred um, traffic stops from uh, the police department to the Department of Transportation. Um, so just thinking through, like, what would it be like to have actual traffic enforcement, because we know that there's dangerous driving behavior out there. Um, but, but what would that look like rather than police officers going on fishing expeditions based on biases about who has um, contraband? Uh, so I, I would think about that, you know, and, and think about the, the prosecutor, you know, dispositions and, and what else, what you see in the system, what you hear from your neighbors, what you think uh, would be a good idea for us to move forward. There are plenty of materials out there. Lots of people are writing about this now. Um, and so now is a really good time to be thinking through what we've been doing hasn't worked. Hasn't worked for anybody. Hasn't worked, and, and this is a way to talk to people who are very law and order. It hasn't worked um, to keep the public safe either. 
hasn't worked in terms of money spent. We spend a large amount of money on um, criminal legal system. Uh, so be thinking about, you know, what, yeah, somebody said their podcast too. They're also, they're great podcasts, lots of them out there. So let's figure out, you know, what we want. I think this is a pivotal moment in Minneapolis in history here. Um, we have a unique moment that I don't think other cities necessarily have. We, we have a bunch of people, politicians, policymakers who want to do something who not all know exactly what to do. And so jumping on this moment in time and showing leadership and, and saying, hey, you know, let's take a look at this. What do we want to do? What do we need that's different? I think now is the time to do it. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and anyone who wants to follow Mary um, on, uh, on Twitter, you absolutely should because the work that she is doing to help us understand the Chauvin trial is just amazing. And we are so grateful that you're doing that work. Um, I'm gonna work with Mary after today just to put together a list of resources and I will follow up with y'all. I'll share those out so that you have them because I know we're getting requests about different resources. Um, and thank you, thank you to everyone for being here today. It was great mm -hmm. for you to spend this time with us. And we hope that you'll be knocking doors and making calls with us and helping us to ensure that Mike Freeman uh, is removed from office and never, no one like him ever holds that office again. <laughs> so thanks for spending this time with us on Sunday. And uh, we'll see you all in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Hey, Matt.